stand up for that. Because I need to be able to see what I'm doing. Well, this lesson brings us to the end of this quarter. And I believe Gary has passed out most of the quarterlies. If you need a quarterly, just let him know, Gary, right here, and he will see that you get one and be ready for our next quarter. You can see the next one, End Times. That ought to prove interesting, studying that. How many of you have learned something you didn't know about stewardship in this last quarter? I hope all of you did. This quarterly showed us that stewardship is more than just paying your tithes and offerings every week. There's so much more to it. And today we're going to do a kind of a summary of it and go over some of the high points. But before we begin, let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the Bible and the lessons that you've given us. We just ask that you be with us now as we study thy word. Please bless each person here. Help them to gain a blessing from it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And also, I don't know if Gary has started the envelope around for the offering. We need to get that done. This lesson, the result of stewardship. Let's look at the memory verse. Which is 1 Peter 2, 12. Okay, look that up. It's here, but... You have it there. I want to read. I'm going to be reading a lot out of the clear word today just because I find it so much easier to understand. And if the name implies, it's a little clearer. Um, the clear word isn't necessarily something you want to teach doctrine out of. But as far as the studying, I think it's excellent. 1 Peter 2, 12. Live such noble lives that your Gentile neighbors who falsely accuse you may one day give their hearts to God and rejoice with you when Christ returns. So, we should live our lives in a way that shows, as we in our stewardship, live our life with stewardship in a way that shows to those around us so that they can be impressed with what happens to us even though we are paying tithe and offerings. You know, if you give a good tithe and offerings, say you, you work with somebody, they make the same money you do. You pay 15, 20%, 10%, whatever you pay to for tithes and offerings. And... You're living as good as them or even better, even though they're not paying that. I think that can be such a, such a strong statement. I know once, years and years ago, I was talking with a, a counselor, financial counselor, and they said, write down what all you make and how much you, you have your bills and all of that and everything. And he looked at it looked at it, and he said, you can't do this. It doesn't work like that. You know, you're not making enough to live. Doing pretty good, you know. I got a place to sleep. I got a warm, warm house and bed, and I got a decent car to drive. I, you know, I'm doing okay. Well, it doesn't work. I said, well, you know, God's blessing us. And every time... You go, we go to the store, Heidi and I, we look around, and I'm looking for a certain thing, and I'm looking for a, like a certain shoe, and finally I find it. Why, it's 30% off. How'd that happen? 
Praise God. He looks out for you, doesn't he? Little things that come along. Well, we ended up with a couple hundred dollars. We didn't know what was going to happen that we didn't expect. God makes things happen for, for us. And that's just the financial aspects. Let's get into this lesson a little bit. It says on the first page, as stewards, we should live as witnesses of the God we serve, which means that we should exert a powerful influence on those around us, an influence for good. Our story then is not to be isolated from the world around us. Instead, we are privileged to reflect a better way of living to those who don't know the things we have been given. Stewardship is the act of thriving while managing God's call to live godly. God gives us the skill to live differently than we would in any other lifestyle on earth. Okay, a light. Now let's talk about this one thing. We'll study it more in the lesson, but it talks about a, a light. Um, where did I read it? But anyway, the idea of being isolated. I understand the attraction when a lot of Adventists go off and move together you know, to live the lifestyle that they would like to live without being influenced by the world around them. But at the same time, you have to get out in that world to witness to them. If I'm in my own little enclave, who am I going to witness to? Other people who believe like I do? Or to the world? We are to be a light into the world, it says. So we have to get out where we can be a witness to others. You know, there's nothing wrong with being close and having living in a place that you can be comfortable, but at the same time, you got to get out and witness. This lesson has so much. I hope we can bring it all out about, you know, if we receive and keep receiving and we don't give, pretty soon we quit receiving. If we don't, you know, you get filled up. You quit, re quit giving, and then you quit receiving. Let's move on to Sunday's lesson. It says, godliness is a vast topic. Godly people live holy lifestyles, becoming like Christ with an attitude of devotion with actions that are pleasing to him. That's in Psalms. Godliness is the evidence of true religion and receives the promise of eternal life. No philosophy, wealth, fame, power, or favored birth offers such a promise. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3, 1-9. look it up in my book and then I'll be much better off. I want you to realize that as bad as times are now, this is nothing compared to the perilous times of the last days. Now think about this as we read this and think about the news you hear each day, whether it's the newspaper or your computer or the television. Think about the things that I'm getting ready to read and see if, if there is any of them that aren't taking place at this time. People will love only themselves and money. They'll be conceited, abusive, disobedient, contemptuous of parents, ungrateful, impious. Many of those will lose all natural affection, will break contracts, slander their friends, lack self-control, be brutal, and be despisers of what is good. I'm not going to read the rest of those. That's enough. That's enough. We don't need to go any farther. You know, there's a whole list of the different things that prove that 
that show how people are in the last days. But as you look at these things and the thing I re- things I read, do you see anything there that isn't happening today? I read this thing, and I, thought, I can see this, I can see this. There's nothing there that I can see that isn't what we've already read. Uh, you know, having a form of godliness, but denying its power. So many people, yeah, the, I know God. Yeah, I know the Bible. Well, what do you know? Tell me about it. Well, I know it. And, you know, you, you quiz them. They don't know anything. They know they've heard of God. But as far as actually telling you anything that they know, they don't know anything. They have a form of godliness that doesn't have anything to do with the power of God. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They hear things. Learning, I'm not sure if that's the right word even, because they hear things and try to take it as knowledge without really studying it and accepting it. I know I've taught... Revelation seminars, you take people through the whole series of lessons, you finish it, they've said which day is the Sabbath, they are clear on the state of the day, all the different things they've been cleared on. And then when we finish, they just say, well, thank you, we really enjoyed it, and go about their merry way. Well, they were learning, but they didn't come to the knowledge of the truth. They didn't accept it they didn't take it into their hearts you know the bible talks a lot about our whole heart but anyway let's keep going the book of job provides a description of job's character and actions it illustrates how a goodly life is revealed even though suffer through suffering it also shows how much satan hates that lifestyle Even God acknowledges that there were no others like Job in his quality of faith and lifestyle. It it says in Job 1.1, There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright and and one who feared God and shunned evil. Thus we see a man whose faith wasn't just an expression of his word or religious. He didn't just talk it, did he? We all know talk is cheap. Although that was part of his life. His fear of God was manifest in an entire life of godliness, even amid horrific trials. Being godly doesn't mean that we are perfect, only that we reflect the perfection of his own spheres, in our own spheres. Okay, let's talk about this idea of reflection. Okay, God, who is the light? God, Jesus, okay. That's who the light is. Do we have any, do we have light? Can we make light? Not really. We reflect light. Can you see light? I can see a light bulb, but I can't see, you know, it's coming from here and it's hitting my hand. I see what it does, but what is my hand doing? It's reflecting that light that comes from the source right up there and that's what we are any light that we have in us is just a reflection from the light from God from Jesus so we have to keep a open connection don't we if we don't have an open connection if I put my hand up and block block that light it goes out gets dim same way as we worship God. We have to keep our connection open with him. We can't just, oh, when we want it. But if we don't have an open connection, we're not reflecting any light. Simple as that. So we have to keep that going on a regular, regular basis. In Job, his fear was, okay, let's Pass on to Joel. Let's read Ezekiel 13, 14. You know, the lesson, it just had Ezekiel 14, 14, but I, I like to read a little more. And it says, Son of man, when a land 
sins against me by persistent unfaithfulness, I will stretch out my hand against it. I will cut off its supply of bread and send famine on it and cut off man and beast from it. Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord. Would they be able to save anybody else from their right, by their righteousness? Only themselves can they save by their righteousness. You know, sometimes when we have prayer up front, we ask for things, or in your family prayer, I usually say, forgive us our sins. And truthfully, all that's really doing is maybe encouraging that person I'm with to ask the Lord to forgive their sins because I can't get the Lord to forgive your sins. Up to you all. Up to me to ask the Lord to forgive me. Sometimes we kind of forget that. And so it, it, it's very important that we realize that. You know, it says, what does this text say that testifies to the character of these men? What do they have in common that should be seen in all of us? What do they have in common? What did it say about their character? They had good character, did it, didn't they? But as good as their character was, it couldn't save other people. Could not save other people. Stewardship is really an expression of a godly life. Let's look over to Mondays. Contentment. Now, this is a good one. Let's read Philippians 11 through 13. See, I added a little more to this one, too. I mean, Philippians 4, 11 to 13. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. They didn't have on that on there. I can't believe they left that off, but anyway. He said, I have been poor, I've been hungry, but I was content through God. I have been all I could eat, good shape, you know, everything, I, all my wants were taken care of. I've been both ways. Amen. But I'm still content in God with whatever condition I am in. Okay, and this text is still on the screen. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It also, I can have faith through Christ who strengthens me. It, it, it fits the same spot. You know, you can have faith even if you, the cancer gets you here for long. You still have that faith that you will be saved through Christ who strengthens me. right let's 
Let's move on. While writing to Timothy, Paul describes an unsavory group of people who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. Let's read 1 Timothy 6, 3 to 6. I'm going to read it out, out of the clear word. If someone in your church does not accept the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and teaches things contrary to the gospel, he's conceited and doesn't understand what he's talking about. Such people have an unhealthy interest in arguing about the meaning of words and end up creating controversy, jealousy, slander, and distrust. This leads to more arguments by people whose minds are deprived of truth. Some think that serving God is a way to get ahead financially. Serving God and doing what is right makes a person rich by giving him contentment, courage, and hope. Go on to seven. We brought nothing into this world, and it certainly will take nothing out of it. Now, this is a popular thing in the world, these prosperity preachers. Send your money to me, and you will prosper, and I'll do okay, too. <laughs> Isn't, and, you know, they misinterpret so many things in the Bible where, him, where he talks about taking care of us and fulfilling our needs, is that, that he's going to give you a lot of money. It just doesn't say that. It really doesn't. It says he will, as we just got through reading about what he would do for us, we would be content in our search situation as long as we are serving him. And these prosperity thing, people who preach that, you know, you look at their lifestyles, the things they have. I'm not going to say any names. There's, there's quite a few of them around. You know, with their airplanes, their, their ranch is big enough to land their airplanes on, their jets. You know, they're doing pretty good. And just if you're ever thinking about that, read, study in the Bible the prosperity because it really, that's not what he is talking about. It really isn't. Let's move on. Did someone have their hand up? I think I... <laughs> yeah, can't take it with you, can you? The last thing I want to say about that, it says the fact is that godliness has nothing to do with wealth. If so, some of the world's nastiest people who have deemed who would have to be deemed godly because they also are some of the wealthiest. So some of the meanest, nastiest people would be, well, they must be doing something right. They must, their Lord is blessing them and they're wealthy. So that is just one example of showing us that that's, that's not the way God operates. No, nope, it is not the way it operates. Let's move on to Tuesday. Proverbs 3, 5. What crucial, mes crucial message is there for us, especially in the last part about not leaning on our own understanding? You know, that gets back to what I was talking about earlier about people who say different things about the Bible and you ask them, and they say, well, I know, I just know. And this idea of leaning on your own understanding, I was in a conversation just this week about, with a lady about, and about something in the Bible, and it was something that I said, it bothers me when people can choose what they want to take out of the Bible. Instead of taking the whole thing well, I like this, I'll take this, but, you know, this other part I don't really care much for. I'm just going to let it be. And she actually defended that type of activity. And, you know, I try not to argue with people, especially when I work, especially when they're one of my bosses. 
but I, I just couldn't control myself completely. I said, well, in 2 Timothy 3, what is it, 16 and 17 or 15 and 16? What? 316. What does it say? Somebody tell me. Yeah, exactly. All scripture is inspired by God. That's all you, it, it tells you what you can use it for, but it's all inspired by God. And what does that mean? You can't just take this part and ignore the rest. I mean, you can, but that's not God's will. You know, I just, I, I didn't even tell her what it said. I just said, why don't you read that and then talk to me about what you can take or, or, or leave. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure just exactly where that's at, but we're, we're going to talk about that a little bit right now. Oh, well, no, I, I actually don't have that text. Um, it said, let's look at Proverbs 3, 5. That's what that says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't depend on your own understanding. Basically what it says there. Okay. When you don't understand something completely, what are you likely to do? Make mistakes. Yeah, if you don't understand. What, what should you do if you don't understand? Seek understanding. Pray for understanding. Study more. You know, there's very few topics in the Bible that just mentions one verse and, and that's it. it. Most things in the Bible are repeated over and over if you just look to find them. But if you lean on your own understanding, say, well, I think that means that. And the other thing is talk to other people who you trust, who will give you their honest opinion, and then check out what they tell you. If, any, if, I, if you ask me something and I tell you, check me out. If the pastor tells you something you're confused about, he'll tell you, then he'll tell you where you can check it out. So if you quit ask him about it. So if someone doesn't want to tell you where to check it out, chances are they're leaning on their own understanding instead of the Bible for their understanding. Anyway, let's move on. We're just about out of time. The motto and aim of God's stewards is to trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. That's should be, that's the motto. Lean not on your understanding. How then do we as servants, stewards, learn to trust in God? By stepping out in faith, obeying the Lord in all that we do now. Trust is an action of the mind that is not depleted with the use. Trust is like exercise, really. You don't, the more you use it, the more you trust, don't you? It's not something you run out of. Yeah, exactly right. On the contrary, the more we trust the, the Lord, the more our trust will grow. Let's move on down the page. It says, it's easier to trust God with the things that you can't control. In that sense, we have no choice but to trust him. That's pretty easy, isn't it? If I can't control it anyway, well, it's pretty easy for me to turn it over to God if I have no control. But it's the other things that's going to go on to say, the things that I do have control over. Say, uh, there's a lot of different things. Say it's eating. Some of us have a little control issue. And it's uh, easy, but easier 
It's hard to turn that over to God, isn't it? Because we try to control it. No, I am not going to open that refrigerator. It's 10 o'clock at night. I'm not going to open that refrigerator. I'm trying to control it. And we all have different things in our life that we try to control as opposed to turning it over to God. We turn over the big things uh, that we, there's no way we can change. You know, you see something in the news and you, would, you might pray for something you see on the news, some bad thing happening, but can I do anything about something happening a thousand miles away? I can't do a thing about it. Not a thing. But I can pray about it and I turn it over to God. So really, it's those personal things that we deal with each day that we have to turn over to God also. You know, there, there's a prayer out that the AA has taken for their own. It wasn't written for them, but they have taken it and use it, and that's fine. But this, the serenity prayer was written by Reinhold Niebuhr. He was born in 1892. It says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and courage to think, change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. Well, as you can see, that's just the first paragraph of the prayer. Living one day at a time and enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as a pathway to peace, taking, as he did, this sinful world as it is not, as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Okay, but the first part, courage to change the things I can, accept the things I cannot change. Now, accept maybe not be the right word because I'm not going to accept sin, but I'm not going to let it affect me in my life I'm not going to dwell on it I'm not going to be upset you know some people live their whole life upset about what they heard or what's going to happen next it's, you just can't live your life like that way and be as this prayer said reasonably happy I think we ought to be a lot more than reasonably happy but sin is on this earth and we have to live in it and we have to accept that fact but we know when God comes, we won't have to accept that any longer. Anyway, we're just about out of time. I want to read a couple more things here um, about the light. For you were on Wednesday's lesson, Ephesians 5, 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And that's one of the ones I want to read out of clear word. Um, Ephesians 5 8. You once did some of the same things because some of these same things because you were in darkness, but now you're different because you're in the light. So you need to live as the children who belong to the light. Before that, in verses 1 to 8, it talks about all kinds, another one of those sections where it talks about all kinds of of bad things that people do on this earth. I'm not going to read all that. But we used to be there until we become children of the light. Now, some people assume that's going to be perfect. Remember those people we talked about, those three men we talked about earlier? Uh, who were they? Daniel was one. Uh, there was three together in one text. Okay, were they all perfect? But did God hold their character up? Is it? Okay, use that as an example, as character. 
our character grows. Our character is the only thing. We aren't taking anything in our pockets when we go to heaven. But our character will go with us wherever we go. And so I want to read one conclusion and then we will be done. There is a constant, wherever there is life in a church, there is increased, there is increase and growth. Thither, there is also a constant interchange, taking and giving, uh, receiving and returning to the Lord his own. To every true believer, God imparts light and blessing. And this is a believer imparts to his work, and he does for the Lord. As he gives of that which he receives his capacity for receiving is increased. Room is made for fresh supplies of grace and truth. Clear light, increased knowledge are his. On this giving and receiving depend on the life and growth of the church. He who receives but never gives soon ceases to receive. If the truth does not flow from him to others, he loses his capacity to receive. We must impart the goods of heaven if we would receive fresh blessing. That's from councils on stewardship. Does that sound like the councils on stewardship? It sounds like it ought to be someplace else. Nothing to do with money, was it? But it was in the book from Ellen White, councils on stewardship. And also, as it talks about receiving and passing it on, what has the pastor been speaking about for the last few weeks? He talks about Continue. You come in and learn. You get prepared with somebody to learn how to do it. Then they pass it on. And then as it passes on, that person, it just continues on. You receive and you give. You receive and you give. That's what this church is about. Receiving God's blessings, his word, and then passing it on to others. That goes along, right along with the Great Commission in Matthew go out unto all the world. We receive, we pass it on. Let's stand now and bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the blessings you've given us. We just ask that you send your Holy Spirit to work in our lives to help us be a good reflection of the life that is Christ. Please bless us now as we go into the church service. We just ask for your many blessings. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.